Good morning, good morning. Who's excited for church? Wow, that was like, like two of you are excited. Awesome. Let's try it one more time. Who's excited for church? We have not met. My name is Ali, and uh, uh, let me just pause. That I don't know if it's just me or there's a lot of sawdust in the room. That was like powerful worship. That song was made for you, Stacey. God bless you for giving your voice to God. Uh, before we begin, just some housekeeping. It's on your screen. We launch groups. Come on, who's excited for groups at Bowl Church? You can jump in at any time. And today, if you, you've been coming for a while and you want to officially join this church, today after service, growth track. It's where you want to come, take your first step in becoming part of this movement called Bold. And next week is probably our, one of our favorite Sundays, Baptism Sunday. We want to help you take that first step of obedience, which is not going to church, which is a good thing, which is not even reading your Bible, which is also a great thing. But Jesus says he says, I want you to go public with your faith. And uh, we are in a collection of talks called Killer Church. And uh, every, I told you before we began this collection, the first three were like in your face, and then next week will be a fun one. The first one, I preached about sin and no one left. And then last week, I preached about the Word of God and it got a lot of positive feedback. Today is a, a different kind of sermon. Uh, normally, when I begin, I, I want to draw you in. I want to tell you stories and create tension and have you lean in why you're going to love this sermon. Today is very, very different than that. I want to tell you all the reasons why you're not going to like today. And I need to go there because one of the reasons why we did this collection of talks is maybe the way that we view God, maybe the way we view the scriptures, maybe the way we view church isn't helping build our faith, it's actually killing it. And one of the attributes of God that I want to talk about today is the least popular. Yeah, I know, me too. <laughs> but it's the most mentioned. It's actually mentioned on your screen 637 times. This attribute of God is mentioned in the scriptures. So even though it's the, the least popular, theologians say it's the most important. And uh, I, I couldn't even write this sermon without getting emotional, without having its truth hit me. And my prayer is that it would stir you, that it would shake you. That at some point you would fall on your knees in repentance, or maybe you'd fall on your face in worship. Because maybe this is the least likely sermon that you want to hear, but it's probably the most sermon that you need to hear. It's a different kind of Sunday. It's a little somber. I'm going to have the keys in the background because I want your jugular today. <laughs> Make it like super emotional. That's why I'm doing it. But I want to talk about an attribute you probably don't hear about often, it's the holiness of God. And the title of my sermon is The Song That Never Ends. There's a song they're singing in heaven. And they, anyone ever listen to a song like 20 times in a row? I annoy my wife. They have this song on repeat for eternity. It's the song that never ends. So let me pray real quick and we'll jump right in. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in this faith community. God, we need today's, I need today's message, God. God, it seems like you're doing something again in Kentucky. God, you show up where you're honored. And we want to try to see you for who you really are, God. I know, God, it's easy to get lost in the mundane, in our mortgages, in traffic, in getting up early to take our kids to school or how to pay for school or maybe we're, we're single and ready to mingle. All these things are important, God. But they pale in comparison to who you are. Jesus, would you help me preach this sermon? We want to walk out with a greater understanding of who you are. If you believe it, everybody said, everybody said, yeah. bold tradition. We get loud before we begin. Can we just give it up for Jesus real quick? 
Uh, I want to start with a, a text that was written 700 years before Jesus was born, and it's the prophet Isaiah. It's Isaiah chapter 6. It's on your screen. When you see it, someone shout amen. In the year that King Uzziah, someone say Uzziah, died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Someone say seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to, other, to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. Let me give you some background because I don't even know what happened seven days ago, let alone 700 years before Jesus died, right? This is King Uzziah. This is a, a, a man who was very righteous, probably one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel. Israel has a lot of bad kings, a lot of unrighteous kings, kings who wore Laker uniforms. Like they're totally ungodly. And then Uzziah is this very righteous man. He changes the country. He began ruling at the age of 16 and ruled for 52 years, half a century. And when he died, it created turmoil. People started freaking out. It says in the year that Uzziah died, it could say in the end of an era. In the end of one of the greatest kings that we've ever had. It's the beginning of our stress, beginning of anxiety. This is like a, a very turbulent time because the greatest, one of the greatest kings is gone. In the year that he died, Isaiah had this vision. I saw the Lord. And he saw him high and lifted high. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And there are these angels called seraphim. They're actually called seraph, plural seraphim. I didn't even know this before. And what is, what is a seraph? It means burning ones. And what's crazy is this is the only time in the scriptures they're mentioned. Like, there's not much more than Isaiah chapter 6. We don't know what they do. We don't know what their job is. Are they assistant to the regional manager? Like, who are these guys? But they got six wings. And they got one song. And there's this picture of a, one artist's rendition of what he thought they looked like. With two, they covered their face because the glory of God was so powerful you couldn't even look at God. They covered their feet because the ground on which they're standing is holy. And with two, they flew. And what they're doing is they're singing. The people who are closest to God, the people who are in relationship with Him, who have a cubicle next to God, they don't describe Him the way that you and I describe Him on Instagram. They don't say he's like this amazing, like, oh my gosh, he's, he's full of love. Oh. They use a very different word. They use the word holy. That's his reputation to those that are closest to him. Let me illustrate this point for, for a moment. Let me show you this picture of one of my, the greatest leaders I've ever met. The guy on the right, on the left, is a guy named Steve Stroop. Planted and founded one of the largest most healthiest, most influential churches in America, and he doesn't even want to be known. It's Lake Point. About 15 years ago, when they're running 10, 15,000 people, he had a vision and a dream. He wanted to influence more people outside the walls of his church than inside the walls of his church. And so about 15, 20 years ago, he started planting churches in the hardest reaching unchurched cities in America, New York, Boston, Seattle, L.A. We're one of the Lake Point church plants. They gave us money. They, they pour into us. And every time I heard about him, the stories were like, oh, he's the Yoda of church planning. Oh, my gosh, he's, the, he's, the, he's one of the best public speakers you've ever seen. Oh, my gosh, he's a leadership guru. And the acronyms and the way they would describe him was just like so, like, it's almost superfluous. It's like, is he really that great? And then I went in 2017 I've gone every year since for a week I spend there. It's one of the best weeks I just get poured into. I get sharpened. And then I got to hung out, hang out with their, his staff. Those that are closest to him. Tell me what Steve is like. And they all kind of used one word. Oh, he's brilliant. The guy would get up in a room of 200 people and shake everyone's hand for one time and then go around the room and recite everyone's name. 
from memory. The guy is br- like, you name a pastor and they call him for wisdom. And it's interesting to me that the people closest to Steve Stroop, God bless you, Steve Stroop, if you ever watch this video, you probably don't ever hear me preach, but <laughs> those closest to him use the word brilliant. Those that are closest to God, they don't use the word brilliant. They don't say, oh, Jesus is like the greatest public speaker. They hide. And they use the word holy. It's the Hebrew word, kadash, kadash, kadash. And in English, we read it from left to right. In Hebrew, you read it from Right to left. It's the only thing I learned in seminary. God bless them. Some people call it cemetery. It was not that, that bad. But it, the Hebrew language is, you, is not that much different than English. When you want to emphasize something, you underline it or you italicize it. You make it bold or you repeat things. This is why Jesus says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you. Because he wants something to be emphasized, he would repeat it. That's why Matthew McConaughey says, all right, all right, all right. Some of you don't even know who that is. Joey from Friends, how you doing? Right? And then he he says it slower the second time, how you doing? Because we want to emphasize something, we repeat it. Every parent in here knows, don't do that. Sit down. Go brush your teeth. Go brush your teeth. Go. It's 930. Go brush your teeth. Because when we want to emphasize something, we repeat it. The Hebrew language is no different. You wouldn't just say it once, you wouldn't say it twice, you would say it three times as the highest form of emphasis. And this is the only attribute of God that is repeated three times in a row. God is not love, love, love. He's not gracious, gracious, gracious. He's not merciful, merciful, merciful. The only time God is repeated three times is is holy, holy, holy. You should take note of that. Because those who are closest to him, they describe him very different than the way that you and I do on Instagram. And this word holy is lost in our churches. When we hear the word holy, we think of holy communion, holy matrimony. Maybe, maybe you're a Monty Python fan, holy grail, I don't know. And it's, it's definitely changed in our culture. We add the word holy before we cuss. Holy blank. And I didn't say your evil heart filled in the blank. Shame on you. Shame on you. I'm not going to say that. I'm trying to be holy. And even Christians use it like holy moly or holy guacamole or holy smoke. And then the worst is when our friends want us to go to the club with them. They're like, oh, you holier than thou? And they shame us with this word. Are you a holy roller? And they try to make you feel guilty for not doing what they want to do. What does holy mean? So on the screen, it means to be set apart, a cut above. It's high and lifted up. And the scriptures want to paint this picture that God's not like me and you. He's not a better version of the the nicest person you know. I know you think your grandmother or maybe Mother Teresa is like this awesome person. God's not a little bit better than that person. God is on a different category. He's separate. He's a cut above. I had this one mentor of mine. His name is uh, Dr. Tony Evans. And he has this awesome illustration where he talks about how he explains the holiness of God using silver, like, dishes. This is from World Market. I think it's like $10. Uh, I eat macaroni and cheese on this thing, right? When I want to reheat my pizza, I put pizza on it and I put it in the microwave. I throw this thing in the dishwasher. It's ordinary. It's average. It's a basic plate, right? But then there are times, I hope, (laughs) then there are times where it's not an ordinary day. This is a vintage plate. In my home, my mom had a china closet, and it was separate. And it was high and lifted up. <laughs> and we ne- you never put this in the dishwasher. 
You, it would be on the table, and you weren't even actually allowed to eat on it. It was just something to see. And if you broke it, oh, my God. My wife, if I broke this, she's spirit-filled, by the way, she would hand you a knife. Do you want to knife yourself, or do you want me to knife you? <laughs> That's how important, because this is separate. This is a cut above. God is separate. He's a cut above. He's above everything you can possibly imagine. He's better than your grandmother. He's better than the nicest person. He's not in the same cat. He's, he's separate. He's above. Above what? Everything. Above everyone and anything you can possibly imagine. In Exodus 15, 11, it says this. Who is like you, O Lord? It's this question. Who is like our God? He is completely, infinitely perfect. Not like partially perfect, totally perfect. He's immutable. He's immeasurable. He's amazing. There is no one like our God. He's self-sufficient. He's self-sustaining. He's self-existent. He has wisdom that he didn't need to learn. He has strength that he didn't need to gain by going to the gym. He has a love that he didn't have to first receive before he gives it. There is no one like our God. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You can give it up for Jesus. He is holy. And I love that in the year that King Uzziah died, when the nation was freaking out over their, one of their greatest leaders dying, God gives Isaiah this vision of his majesty, of who he really is, and watch what happens to Isaiah, who's probably the most righteous man in all of Israel. And look what happens when he gets in the presence of God. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost. Some translations say, I am ruined. I'm undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Anyone had ever ride a roller coaster before? A few of you, awesome. Some of you need to get out more. <laughs> I was terrified until the age of 18. Just terrified of heights. Then I finally went on. And I remember the first like five minutes of the roller coaster, my eyes were closed. And my booty was, mm, right? Everyone is. And then I went through it, and I immediately went through the exit and went straight back in to the line. Because I'm like, I'm an addict. For like 10 years, my Instagram handle was roller coaster tester. I loved him so much. <laughs> and we think God's like that. That the first time I meet him, the first time I'm around him, I'm going to be scared. But oh my gosh, he's like a teddy bear. He's a, he's a, he's a blanket. Was, oh, in Matthew 17, Jesus takes his three best friends, Peter, James, and John, up a mountain because he wants to pray with them alone. And Jesus begins to glow because he's not just a man. He's not a prophet. He's God in the flesh. And the Bible calls it the transfiguration. And all three men fall on their face, terrified, the Bible says. And you think, oh, my gosh, this is the first time they're riding the roller coaster. Second time is going to be way better, right? We fast forward 50 years. John has been walking with Jesus for two-thirds of his life. Some theologians say he's 80 to 90 years old. He's on the island of Patmos, and Jesus shows up again in his glory. In Revelations 1, it says that John, who was there when he was 20, now he's 80, falls down as a dead man. You never get comfortable around the holiness of God. I love what Isaiah does here. He says, I'm undone. This is what happens when you get in the presence of God. Then Isaiah 6 says this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth. and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. What I want you to see is what Isaiah didn't do 
and what he did do. He didn't pull out his cell phone and like sing along karaoke, holy, holy, holy. He didn't join in. He didn't worship. He just started repenting. Woe is me. Woe, and he started backing up. And the question is, what did God say? What did God do to elicit that response? God did nothing. God didn't even say anything. He just was. His, his presence is so perfect. His, his majesty is so holy and different. It just pulls this out of him. And I love that he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. And my first thought is, is he a Lakers fan? Because those guys cuss like sailors. This is a, this is a prophet. This is a professional Christian. His whole job is to talk about God in a right way, using the right words. And immediately he becomes aware of his sinfulness. And immediately he's like, I know everyone in this country thinks I'm like the most righteous. In the category of good, God is high and lifted up. He's separate. I'm not even on the same level. He's holy and I'm not. Look what Billy Graham says. It is only when we understand the holiness of God will we understand the depths of our sin. The closer you get to Jesus, the more self-aware you become. Maturity is an openness to talk about how jacked up you are. I remember when I first came to church, I hid all the brokenness I had because I didn't want people to know. Everybody knows, bro. Come on. But when you meet Jesus, you realize he's not like you and me. He's separate. He's high and lifted up. He's a cut above. And it's self-righteous Christians who point out the sin of other people. Oh my gosh, did you see the way she dressed? Oh my gosh, did you see what she did? Oh my gosh, blah, 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 blah. Self-righteousness is about comparing yourself with other people. But when you're in the presence of God, you don't think about other people. You're comparing yourself to God. And you realize, I don't even care what's happening with them. I love the order. Isaiah said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I'm also around a people. He hangs out with prophets. He's like, all of us. Me first, though. And I love that Isaiah doesn't beg for forgiveness. He's like, God, I'll, I'll read my Bible every day. Just give me one more chance. I'll join the dream team. I'll go to groups. I'll give anything you want, God. He's just, he's just repenting. And God initiates. Watch what it says in Isaiah 6, verse 7. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. God is so good that he initiated the atonement. It wasn't that Isaiah wanted it. If you understand this, you understand Christianity. When you and I were in sin, God pursued us. Romans chapter 5, verse 7 says, God, and, but God, showed his love for us that while we were still in the club, in our addiction, in our jealousy, in our boyfriend's bed, in our addiction, in our greed, wherever you were, doesn't matter. God pursued you. He came after you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Who is like our God? There's only one person who's kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. There's only one who's holy, holy, holy. And he's separate. And he's high and lifted up. There is no one like our God. To prepare for this message, I... It's actually a lifetime of study, but there are two books that deeply impacted me. I want to show you these two books. One is by R.C. Sproul that wrecked me when I read it a decade ago, The Holiness of God. And one I read about maybe three or four months ago called Holier Than Thou by Jackie Hill Perry. And she has this quote in this book 
that wrecked me, that I can't get out of my head. I want to read it to you. If God is holy, then he can't sin. If God can't sin, then he can't sin against you. And if he can't sin against you, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being there is? See, we think when we hear the word holy, we're supposed to run away from him. But this attribute should cause you to run towards him. You can trust him. You can cast your cares upon him. He'll never hurt you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never harm. He'll never put you in a situation that isn't best for you because he's holy. It's not that he's loving. It's that his love is holy. It's not that he's powerful. It's that he's, his power is holy. It's not that he's gracious. It's that his graciousness is holy. There's no sin in him. There's no imperfection in him. He is perfect. And because of that, you can trust him. You can never do anything that cause him to love you more. You can never do anything that cause him to love you less. And my favorite part of this story is in the year that King Uzziah died, the end of an era, one of the greatest kings, this sinful man, Isaiah, has this revelation that he's not on the same level as God. And goes, woe is me. God forgives him. God initiates. God wants to extend that promise to you. And my favorite part is one chapter later in Isaiah chapter 7. Don't show it yet. Crazy things happen. But I want to read you Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 first. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Because of your mercy, because of your forgiveness, because you're the only one who's seen me for who I really am, I fall short and you still love me. You still initiated. Anything you want, yes. Anything you want me to do, I'm your man. Tell me where to go, I'll, I'm, I'll go. You want me to serve, I'll serve. You want me to give, I'll give. You want me to do group, forget, I'll do anything you want. When's the last time you were stunned by the holiness of God who initiated your atonement that you didn't deserve it? Because the only response is whatever you want, God. Yes, you're that amazing. You're that good. Isaiah said, send me. And the very next chapter, the Israelites, the nations around them hear their king has died and they mount up the horses because they're going to go wipe the Israelites off the map and they come to Isaiah and they say Isaiah our king is dead are we going to die and Isaiah goes to the Lord and says are we going to survive Lord and God says yes and they come back and they're like we don't believe you give us a sign prove it now you understand one of the greatest Christmas verses is around the holiness of God. Isaiah chapter 7. Therefore, this is the sign that you want, that you won't get wiped out. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel. The sign that I'm going to rescue you from the greatest problem in your life, it ain't that country. It ain't the economy. It ain't the political climate. It's sin. And this is a promise of the good shepherd. The resurrection and the life. The door. The vine. The one who laid down his life. He's kadosh. 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 Jesus is holy. Holy, holy. And I don't know about you, I'm so thankful that he didn't come for people with clean lips, but he came for people like me who have unclean lips. I don't know about you, but I'm so thankful he didn't come for the healthy, but he came for the sick. I'm so health thankful that he didn't come for the holy, but he came for the unholy like me. I want to show you this picture. Because a lot of Christians in America are like losing it. 
because this dude named Sam Smith sang a song called Unholy. What a play on words. Oh my gosh, how can you do this? Let me tell you, when you're close to God, you don't care what other people are doing. It's very self-righteous to say shame on you. This is what I want to show you, though. Your, this is Gen Z, by the way. We are actually in a time in history, America's, there are more people that don't identify as Christian than any other time in history. American history. Silicon Valley's the most unchurched. It's been that way for a long time, but that, that's spreading now. There, 80% of kids in this generation, when they go to high school, they walk away from God. 20% of Gen Z identifies as LGBT. I love that in the same month Satan was worshipped, God showed up again. And no one in that room is talking about Sam Smith, by the way. You know what they're saying? I'm sinful. I don't measure up to the holiness of God. If I can get you to stand for a moment, I want Ethan to sing a song for us. Thank you. And I want you just to reflect what God is saying. Because God's, God's here. God's building his church. And when you get close to him, you're not worried about the person next to you. You're not concerned with their sin. You're just repenting. God is holy. He's separate. He's a cut above. He's not like me and you. And with every eye closed and every head bowed, I, I want some of you just to humble yourself before the presence of God. Just begin to confess. Thank you. 
that he died on a cross to atone. It's not that you and I do good works to be forgiven. We can't. Jesus did all the work. But to receive it, you have to believe in Jesus. That he died on a cross for your sin, but he didn't stay dead. He came back, conquered the grave. Now there's a lot of good news to tell because the tomb is empty. Amen. church is growth track. For some of you, you've been doing Christianity all alone. It's time to go into a group. Those of you that want to go public with your faith that you just declared privately, sign up for baptisms next week. Before I give it back to Ethan, let me just pray for the offering. God, thank you so much. Thanksgiving and